Hello, you're watching the Light Nova Sprite video series on the theology of the body. This video is on audience 50. We are your hosts. I am Jeremy Hossauter. And I'm Guillermo Moreno. All right, audience 50. That means by this point, you should have watched 40 or 49 videos or 50, including the video on the structure of the theology body. That's just quite a lot of material really says something about just how much JP2 put into this topic, theology of the body. And yet we are a little over a third through the theology of the body. So we still have a long ways to go because there are 133 audiences, but it feels good to hit that 50 mark right now. All right. So audience 50 begins a new section. And this section is focused on the theme, well, it's titled Purity as Life According to the Spirit. And this life according to the Spirit is in reference to the Holy Spirit, one of the three persons of the Trinity. And we are going to be looking at the words of St. Paul. St. Paul will be the focus of our attention for this entire section, looking at various um, texts from his letters. So let us dive into audience 50 now. The Sermon on the Mount. So just looking backwards for a moment, our analysis of Matthew 5, verses 27 through 28, informed us that concupiscent desire is the opposite of purity, and that there's this moral demand for a purity of heart. We see, for example, Matthew 5, verse 8, quote, blessed are the pure in heart because they will see God, end quote. And so the Sermon on the Mount is an invitation, an invitation to the heart. And the heart is the source or the wellspring of both purity and impurity. It is in the heart of man that man makes his decision with his personal being for purity or against purity, whether one's going to live a life according to purity or whether they're going to live according to the concupiscence of the flesh. And so the task is really to dive into what is this purity? So, here we have a nice quote from Matthew 15. Would you like to read it, Guillermo? Yes, I would. Awesome. Yep. Um, a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Not that, excuse me, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth defiles a man. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This is what makes a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, prostitution, theft, false witness, blasphemy. These make a man unclean, but to eat with unwashed hands does not make a man unclean. The word of the Lord. All right. Yeah, thank you, Guillermo. Yep. As you were reading it, I guess just one thing I wanted to point out that I was reminded of is just this concept of the heart, right? We got to remember that Jesus is working with the Hebrew concept of the heart as the center of man. Uh, it's from the heart of man that you have this choice for God or against God, for virtue or for vice. As it says here, for out of the heart comes evil intentions. And it's these it's the evil in the heart that makes a man unclean so similarly man in the heart has a capacity for purity just like as it has a capacity for evil that's just something to keep in mind is that the heart represents kind of the personal center of man but as the seat of his kind of personal identity um, Guillermo, do you have any thoughts thus far about our audience? 
yeah, going back to this quote from the Gospel of Matthew, what comes to mind is the fact that if we do eat without washing our hands, you know, that is going to affect our health, of course, um, or most likely it would than, than if otherwise. That kind of just goes to show in a, broad, in a deeper sense the truth behind Christ's words that what really makes us uh, unclean, what really makes us impure, what really hurts us is um, what comes out of the heart, not what goes into the body. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I vaguely recall just people whenever they explain to like high schoolers and whatnot, like just imagine eating junk food, right? So I never did like that analogy because you can eat a lot of junk food and not feel sick, depending on what it is. Right. But, but it's that kind of idea okay. that they're trying to establish some for some people. I guess mm. so. And then on top of that, some people just have better metabolism than yeah. others. Well, what about those who have who have good metabolism? Right. Yeah. I, I never did like that. Oh, All right. Looks like we switched for some reason. Hmm. That's awkward. Oh, well. Yeah. An another point, though, just thinking about what you were saying, reminded me of how really the New Testament is a new ethos in comparison with the Pharisees and some of the traditions of the Old Testament where the Pharisees pay attention to, yes, you have to wash everything in a particular way or it's not clean. And they, so they focus on the exterior without taking into consideration whether their heart is clean or not. You know, it's, it's that shift from not the hands but the heart that makes man clean or unclean right yes all right did you have anything else for us guillermo i did not all right well wait and see if you have more of that the old testament and purity so let's, we want to focus for a moment on this concept to dirty which we could just simply mean to make unclean, to pollute. An example is seeing oneself as unclean when the body is unclean and so it must wash the self. In the, in the Old Testament, we had ritual washings. Many washings were prescribed due to sexual impurity. And this, of course, was in some respect understood physiologically, right? Just... I'm thinking about how you have these laws like Leviticus where the woman is menstruating and that was seen as an impurity that required ritual washing. And so a lot of these washings of the Old Testament were hygienic and they so they possess an indirect religious meaning precisely because they were prescriptions of God, but they had this hygienic purpose. And so the concern here was more so for ritual purity. And this kind of idea then leads to a wrong understanding of moral purity, where moral purity appears to be exclusively tied to the external and material. And I just want to note footnote 58 here, where we have this discussion of three schools within the Old Testament for understanding purity, the prophetic, the priestly, and the legal. And it's the legal tradition that appears to give rise to this wrong understanding. Um, Guillermo, do you have any comments about Old Testament and purity? Um, no, okay. I don't. Thank you, though. All right, let's see here. Christ in purity, then. So Christ opposes this kind of external physiological interpretation of moral purity because it is what's inside of man, not, in, not what is outside of him, that makes man unclean. And so the wellspring of moral purity arises from the heart, that is the interior 
interiority of man. So the ethical meaning of purity cannot be connected with the physiological understanding. These two meanings, the physiological interpretation of purity and the ethical meaning are distinct and separate from each other. And the concept of that Christ is working with for the purity of heart cannot be understood in this external physiological way. So the text of Matthew 15 then stresses the importance of moral purity in the inner dimension of man because the focus is on the heart of man, whether the heart is clean or unclean, whether it's morally good or morally evil. So moral purity then is connected to the concept of virtue. And so you have this analogy now between purity with moral goodness and dirty or unclean with moral evil. And Christ here is not speaking about any particular sin, but of sin in general. And so purity and impurity here are spoken of in general as general terms for good and evil, not for particular sins. So every moral good manifests purity and every moral evil manifests impurity. Um, did you have any other thoughts about this, Guillermo? I did. And so far as I think in the end, it's well yes christ is opposed to this external physiological interpretation of moral purity uh at the same time what i do recall is when christ tells the leper to go and present himself to the temple once he's once he's cured to go present himself to the priest to be declared clean so even Christ is alluding to this continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That just came to mind, and I just wanted to point that out as well. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Like, even in Christ's time, you still have this respect for the law. Yes. Like, even though Christ is the fulfillment of that law, he still respects and obeys it. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. All right. I believe that is the end. Nope. St. Paul. How can we forget about St. Paul? So <laughs> our task now is to connect the content of the Sermon on the Mount with the teaching of St. Paul. So if recall, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, here, St. John talks about the threefold concupiscence, that is the concupiscence of the flesh, the concupiscence of the eyes, and the pride of life. And this threefold concupiscence is the antithesis within man between God and the world. And St. Paul likewise describes a tension, and his tension is between the life according to the spirit that is the Holy Spirit and life according to the flesh. And a couple of key texts we will be looking at is Galatians 4 and Romans 8. We'll also be looking at some texts from 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians. So it's really a lot of different texts that JP2 is going to be pulling from in our analysis of St. Paul. So again, the task is to demonstrate that the purity of heart, as described in the Sermon on the Mount, is, that is connected with the concept of concupiscence from 1 John, is going to be realized in St. Paul's conception of the life according to the Spirit. So our task now is connecting all these dots together to form a all right Guillermo last chance any last comments for our audience um I might be jumping the gun so let's might go ahead be. and look at the yeah yeah let's look at the following audience 
All right. In that Next case, <laughs> thank you for watching our video. If you have been enjoying our content, please subscribe to our social media, like, comment, share. And if you have, I would also like to ask that if you have been enjoying our content, please consider making a financial donation through either Patreon or PayPal. Your financial support goes towards the maintenance of our website and the purchase of material so that we can continue providing you with great resources such as this video series and our many wonderful articles on our website. You can read them at lenovelespreet.com and there you can also find our podcast. Um, Guillermo, can you give us some more information about our podcast, please? Yes, in our other podcast series, we talk about a variety of other topics, such as trends in culture and politics, and we address them from a Catholic personalist perspective. You can listen to our episodes on the Lenovella Spree website under the podcast page, in the podcast page, excuse me. You could also locate us using that page on buzzsprout.com where we upload our episodes, and you can listen to us on Buzzsprout or use Buzzsprout to locate us in other popular po podcast platforms such as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. All right. And just to clarify, if you are wondering where at do I find all the social media, you could just simply go to lenovellespreet.com slash subscribe. And there you will find links to our Facebook YouTube, PayPal, Patreon, the various places our podcast is distributed, all right there on one page. That is, again, at lenovellespreet.com slash subscribe. Um, are, did I forget anything, Guillermo? I don't believe so. Okay. No, no. If, nope. And I, I, for one, uh, would like to ask our audience to keep us and our mission in their prayers. All right, yes, please pray for us. And with that, we will see you next time. Bye, everyone. God bless.